the season hadn't yet started. This was back in mid-September, training camp up in Cranberry. I was talking to Brian Rust casually just about what he expected of himself this season. And in referring back to last season, I found that I had to hesitate a little bit in describing what he'd need to do as a bounce back because he did have 20 goals. But guess what? He's bounced back anyway and in a big way. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins and it comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're in two football and or baseball. I also happen to offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. Penguins 4, Kings 3 in overtime. And Rust was so awesome that he scored twice in overtime, which you will never see again in your lifetime, presuming you stayed up late enough last night and into the wee hours of this morning to catch it. Uh, It was an offside play, the first one, and he went in and took a quality shot that was stopped by Phoenix Copley, got the rebound, buried it. It was waved off. And then next shift goes out there, takes a, a slick feed from Evgeny Malkin, and comes all the way around and stuffs a wrap around for the victory. It was almost, at least it felt this way, back to back. Really, really impressive stuff. Listen to Mr. Mustache speaking with reporters in Los Angeles last night. The first one, when I first got it, I thought it was offside, so they didn't blow a whistle, and I just kept playing, and the puck went in, and I celebrated like it was a goal, and I wasn't too surprised when it didn't count. Um, I was able to get out there right away again and make the most of it, and um, I'm happy that happened. Now, I'm not about to pull out the great big foam finger to wag it in everybody's faces who suggested that the Penguins went too far in signing too many of their guys and that Rust never should have gotten the contract that he got when, in fact, at the time Rust signed the contract, everyone couldn't believe that he took that little instead of putting himself on the open market. But never mind all that, because Rust is right now playing the way he has over most of his Pittsburgh tenure every once in a while. And it's probably going to happen this season too. He'll go into a, a funk where he'll still look like himself out there, but he won't finish. Think, you know, Ricard Raquel, you know, where you're doing a lot of things, right? But you're just not getting the numbers. Well, Russ's numbers right now through 12 games are seven goals and five assists. He's tied with Sid and Gino for the team lead in goals. And the number that really should mean something to you is that out of the 39 shots he's registered on net, he's converted 18.0% of them. Last year, 211 shots, 9.5% conversion on those. If you go over his career, and I'm just going to read you the percentages, his shooting percentage. Over the previous four seasons, it was 12.8, 17.9, 14.3, 13.3. He had turned himself into a good National Hockey League finisher. And when I say he turned himself into it, I mean that. Because this guy, maybe as much as anybody I've covered on this team, certainly more than anybody since Pascal Dupuis, made himself into the first line player that he is today. He went from fourth line afterthought to guy who looked like he couldn't pass to save his life when he first came up as a kid to a legitimate first line winger in the NHL. He didn't make the plays that he made last night in overtime because he's out there with Sid. He made them because those are plays that he makes. He worked himself, and I mean worked, worked, worked. I can't use that word enough in this segment. To add skill to his game, 
to add precision, to add little tricks, little things that he does with the puck, the way he'll receive a pass, the way he'll kick the puck from his blade, meaning his skate blade, to his stick blade in the same motion, stuff that he learns from Sid, stuff that he'll learn from Jake, two obviously really, really smart players in addition to being skilled themselves. And he's put it all together. And to have him be out there performing as he has, look, I'm not not ignoring the elephant in the room here. Yes, they swept the California trip, okay? They took all three games. They beat what might have been the hottest team in the NHL last night on their rink where they got posterized a year ago. Good for them. They left here three and six. They're coming home six and six. That's that's the bounce back, okay? That's the bigger, broader one. But within that, you need to have your best players be your best players. And I have insisted throughout this, those of you who've been listening for a while will recall, that Russ needs to be one of those. He can't be somebody that you throw on the side and whatever you get is a bonus. That's not how this roster is structured. Next... Everybody's going to start working on Raquel. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Cody and says, DK, which pair of players would you be excited to see a chemistry growth from? For me, I think if you can get Eric Carlson and Drew O'Connor to get on the same page, it could be monstrous. Carlson's long, accurate passes to a speeding breakaway DOC would give teams nightmares. Cody, I will give you credit for being inventive. I will say that when I read the the question portion of your J1Q, I was sure you were going to refer to it as anytime anybody brings up chemistry in hockey, you're talking about line mates or defense partners. And you went from defense to forwards. And those are really, really rare chemistry settings. I'm going to give you an example from the game last night in L.A. Did you notice that when Sid went out there for the three on three overtime? that Chris Letang was out there with him. Now, I understand three on three, there's a lot more uh, interaction, direct interaction, including in the attacking zone between the forward and the defenseman. So I'm probably not given the best example here, but I couldn't help but notice that Mike Sullivan was aware enough of how the two of them think when they're both on the ice to make sure that they stay together. My feeling as it relates to Carlson and chemistry is is different. You might recall that over the first, I don't know, two, three weeks of this season that I was maybe even belaboring the point that this team wasn't using Carlson the way he's intended to be used. And I wasn't even pinning that on the coaching staff. I was pinning that on his teammates. You're not going to, nor should you try to change this magnificent gift that showed up in your locker room on your bench and on the ice. You adjust to him, even if you yourself are great. And what I've noticed probably more over the past week than I had over the entire previous part of the season combined was that the great players are adjusting to Carlson. What do I mean by that? They're feeding him when he wants to be fed. They're allowing him to command the entire upper part of the attacking zone on the power play. You see him last night. Did you see him drift over to the left? Uh, backing off, but setting himself up for a shot if it was needed, but at the same time making sure that he was springing Sid or Gino on the other side. That's Carlson. 
while you're also aware of the fact that he's probably going to try some insane deke on somebody out there at the point, even though you're left naked if he fails, but you're now seeing Gino or whoever's across from him at the point kind of slide back like, oh man, he's going to try one of those again. Way more significant. Watch Sid when he's on the ice with Carlson. In the attacking zone, watch where Sid goes. He will park himself at either one lip of the crease or the other. I even noticed him doing it a couple of times between the two Los Angeles games on the left side where he never goes. But you know why he's there? Because Carlson's a right shot and Carlson's on the right point. And he's putting himself into the best possible spot to utilize what Carlson is better than anyone on the planet at doing, which is feeding pucks low, feeding pucks into the slot. I know this is not the answer that you were looking for. I need to see a lot more of DOC catching long breakouts to believe in it. I know what you're remembering. He did it a couple of times in the preseason games. He's certainly capable of it, but I'm not thinking too much about how third line matches up with, uh, you know, anything that's happening behind it because the, the lineage between the forwards and the defensemen isn't nearly that consistent. I appreciate the question, Cody. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins today. Uh, All week long, hope everybody has a terrific weekend. I'll be covering Penguins versus Sabres tomorrow night. This esteemed program will be back Monday.